ladies and gentlemen, let us discuss a recent interview with Oxide Games. Now, Oxide Games are working on a new engine, the Nitrous engine, which is a very advanced architecture and is going to be exclusively created for the next generation consoles and PC. So in this Red Gaming Tetacom video, we're going to be discussing this recent interview. So the Nitrous engine is engineered to be 64-bit architecture compatible and it's been created so that it can render large amounts of units, large amounts of light sources, indeed complicated light sources and much more. So the question was asked, do they believe, in other words, do Oxide believe that the PS4 and the Xbox One will be capable of handling Nitrous to its fullest potential? Dan Baker, who is the chap being interviewed at Oxide, said yes. Both platforms have eight CPU cores, which is exactly the type of system that Nitrous is designed to be uh, used in the fullest. Indeed, one of Nitrous's key features is what's known as SWARM. That's an acronym, of course. It stands for Simultaneous Work and Rendering Rendering, I'm sorry, Models. Now, this pretty much means that the render, the renderer, shall I say, to call upon whatever processor cores are available and then allow them to do the job. So, how would it, will that differ from other engines? For example, the Unreal Engine or the Crytek Engine. The Unreal Engine alone, for example, is extremely popular and is used in an absolute swathe of games. Um, pretty much everything from Devil May Cry all the way to, of course, first-person shooters utilize the Unreal Engine. Dan responded that it's essential the next-generation engines be able to utilize the 8-core architectures that are now commonplace. Cry Engine and Unreal are excellent engines. Oxide isn't developing Nitrous to compete directly with them, but rather to handle the types of games that aren't well suited to those types of engines. Nitrous is really designed for those type of games. Nitrous, uh, Oxide wants to make their no available technology for that, so we decided to build our own. Now, what's important for us to realize, and this is out of quote, is that the technology in the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, in terms of the CPU, as far as what we are aware, anyway, six of the eight cores, so um, obviously two are left over for general operating system tasks, share functions, whatever else, so that means there's six cores available. But going wide, parallel computing, in other words, getting all of the processes to do their job. And not just that, it's important that you have one orchestrator, one processor, which maybe delegates the tasks to all the others. But having them all um, basically be fully utilized, for example, Let's say you have, let's just give easy numbers rather than working with six. Let's say you have a tri-core system. Let's say you have one core, which let's call that core, core A, and let's say you have core B and C. Well, there's no point in having core A do, say, 100% work. So that core is fully loaded. It can't take any more. The, the engine's maxed out. And then you have core B and C. Now, B and C, you have, say, core B doing 70% and core C going between 70 to 85. In other words, they're not being fully utilized. And that is something that next generation consoles can't really abide. Next generation consoles, the CPU clock speed, the frequency is lower than, say, a desktop PC. Therefore, it's imperative for the game's developers to make sure that those cores are fully used, fully um, utilized, and fully optimized. So what about the ES RAM? It's a fairly infamous question by now. I'm sure many of you are probably aware of the issues, but it goes something like this for the two or three of you who are not too in tune. Effectively, it's a small on-die amount of memory that's there to make up for the gulf between GDDR5, which is, say, the PlayStation 4, or the higher end, or even the medium end, to be honest, PC GPUs are using, versus the DDR3 memory of the Xbox One. The idea is simple. It's pretty much acts as a fast swap, so it can be used for multiple different things, for example texturing, or it could be used for say rendering, um, say the frame of animation, whatever it needs to be used for. Now Dan has stated that we can't 
comments specifically on the Xbox One's technical specifications, we can say that there are pros and cons of having embedded RAM in general. The primary limiting factor for embedded uh, GPU on a CPU is certainly going to be the bandwidth. On the PC side, the memory bandwidth from the GPU is going to be a limiting factor in most cases of a typical PC with DDR3 memory. In fact, by the way, I will elaborate on this a little bit more in just a moment. In fact, on certain Haswell configurations, Intel has added 128 megabytes of embedded RAM for exactly that reason. For certain operations, this could be a massive speed up. On the negative side, it always will be more work to use those configurations where there is different memory banks with different speeds and sometimes not always possible to fit your data set into them. So what they're basically speaking about there, um, and you can actually find more about this on a couple of the articles on Red Gaming Tech, so you can check them out, those out. But effectively, what they're discussing is that the Haswell processors, which are the latest processors from Intel, some of them have um, embedded 128 megabytes of memory. Now, these are typically for systems, PC systems, that don't really do too much gaming, or maybe just for low-power systems, for example, laptops. The purpose is simple. Rather than having, say, the typical PC setup, which may be an AMD or NVIDIA discrete GPU, in other words, one that has its own plug-in, um, it'll have its own local memory, for example, GDDR5 memory, say, 2 gigs or 3 gigs of GDDR5. Instead, there won't be any of that, so you'll have 128 megabytes of this embedded memory, known as DRAM, and in addition to that, you'll have the system's main system memory. So, for example, it could be 4, 8, 16, whatever the PC is configured with. The issue is that in situations like this, and there are tests of this, you can Google it yourselves, what typically happens is when games run into high resolutions, particularly if there's a lot of texturing, it basically, this embedded memory runs out, and so games start to really suffer. This does back up quite a lot of what games developers have been stating. For example, one of the developers yesterday was saying that if you use deferred rendering with the Xbox um, One and the ES RAM, it does negate some of the advantage that the PlayStation 4's memory is using uh, with the unified memory. The issue, of course, is simple. If you don't do any optimizations, there's simply not enough fast memory available, so therefore you always have to make sure that you're rendering correctly, you've got the right data into the right location, and it's not good for easy optimization, but it's certainly doable. Indeed, Dan even pointed out that the PS4 architecture is actually something they love, and they would actually like to see eventually uh, PC speeds, clock speeds move up, um, because with PC, one of the issues right now is that DDR3, uh, especially the slower DDR3, is actually lack of bandwidth. Now, it's not always the case, and it typically happens if, as I said, you're utilizing situations where you have the GPU and the CPU on die. Um, but bandwidth is still an issue, even on things such as Haswell uh, processors. Particularly if you're getting multi-core situations, it's not a huge deal yet, but we're probably getting to the point where we're going to have to start moving to a faster DDR4, uh, say DDR4, uh, because honestly speaking, if you compare the T-flop performance of, say, a CPU versus, say, a even medium-range GPU, there's an absolute massive disparity before, between the two performance. So, basically, because of that, you don't need so much memory bandwidth to somewhat feed the beast. Now, they weren't really too keen to answer the question regarding 1080p and 60fps. All he said is that this would be possible um, if it was a priority. However, keep in mind that films play back at 24 FPS, so it really depends on the type of game and what the game's developer feels would be best in terms of the frame rate. Now, we've discussed this very heavily recently, but effectively it goes like this. If you go to 60 frames per second from 30, it basically means that the GPU has exactly half the amount of time to draw every frame of animation. 
Now, imagine that you have to, say, paint a canvas, right? I say to you, okay, you've got five minutes to paint a canvas or to draw something in Photoshop, whatever you, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. And then I say to you, okay, you've got that down. Now I want you to do exactly the same thing, but rather than doing it in five minutes, you've actually got two and a half minutes, in other words, half the time. Could you do it in so much detail? The answer is, of course, probably not. Um, obviously, you do get speed painters, but if you were to give them twice the amount of time, imagine how much more detail they could do. This is pretty much the same for a GPU. This has been something I've been stating for a while. A game engine can render things in 150,000 frames a second. Okay, I'm completely naturally exaggerating as being silly, but you could do 100 frames a second, 120 frames a second. PC monitors do that. They do. But you need very high-end GPUs to do it. It's that simple. In fact, if the game's very complicated, for example, Battlefield 4 on very high settings, you may need, say, a dual GPU configuration. So, yeah, if you want to play in high resolution, for example, higher than 1080p, and you want over 60 frames a second, you're going to be paying for it. On the other hand, if your target is 1080p with average levels of anti-aliasing and you want let's just say all the texture quality and everything else at high then you can do it with one GPU similarly the same thing with a console right so the better the graphics you want the games developers want the more complicated the lighting the more complicated the, the polygons to make the models the the texturing the AI, whatever they are doing with that game, even things such as hardware physics, it's going to become extremely hungry on the resources of the system. Therefore, that's why a lot of developers, particularly ones Oxide, when you know they are creating the engine, it's not really for them to say, well, you know, the system's not capable. Like, for example, if it was putting out a game like Pong, you know, you could do that. That you could do that on the PlayStation One, for the love of God, at 60 frames a second. But you can't expect the PlayStation One to be doing a much more complicated game at 60 frames a second. So, in other words, that's why that this answer always comes out because it really just does depend on the game. Rise, Son of Rome. Um, you know, they they stated that you know they they played around with the resolution quite a lot and they went to the 30 frames a second. But if you look at the game, it does look really beautiful. But there's reasons for that. They basically made the sacrifice. You know, you play, you pay your blood toll. And in this case, the blood toll is frame rate or resolution because you can't have everything on a fixed system. It's the issue with console gaming, of course. That's not to say PC gaming is completely issueless. It's just each system has its uh, quirks and difficulties. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this. I checked this interview out on Gaming Bolt, so you can check it out if you would like. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.